Virginity, a concept as old as civilization itself, revered in some societies and far too often used as a tool of control and dominance. It's no secret that societies throughout history have placed a high value on a woman's virginity, often leading to desperate measures to feign, restore or fake this state of untouched purity. But have you ever wondered just how far some would go to maintain this illusion? We take you back to the Middle Ages, where the symbol of untouched virtue was often guarded fiercely with chastity belts, locked metallic contraptions said to have been popularized by crusaders looking to enforce fidelity in their absences. But do you ever wonder what happened when this so-called virtue was compromised, or worse, never existed to begin with? Enter the world of the boudoirs of Georgian England, where the upper-class ladies often resorted to using lemons and vinegar-soaked sponges as archaic, yet shockingly common, forms of re-virgination. Or fast forward to the 19th century China, where brides used mysterious artificial hymens to give the illusion of virginity. As we peel back the layers of history, we encounter an array of peculiar, disturbing, and often cruel methods used to forge this idealized state of innocence. As noted feminist and writer, Germaine Greer once said, the traditional paradigm of virginity is something to be lost or given away. The modern one is something to be got rid of. Join us as we trace this disturbing path of deceit, illusion and pain. In a world where virginity was more than just a state, it was a matter of survival. Welcome to the diary of Julius Caesar. Dawn of purity, unveiling virginity in antiquity. In the tapestry of human history, the concept of virginity has woven intricate patterns, shaping societies and influencing individuals' lives in profound ways. The seed of this idea traces its roots back to some of the earliest civilizations known to us. One cannot delve into the topic without a nod to ancient Egypt, a society dating back to around 3100 in the Year of the Lord, that deeply revered purity and chastity. Here, young women often bore a cloth over their clothing, an emblem of their untouched status, a fascinating bit of historical dressing etiquette. Yet, the discourse of virginity truly crystallized in ancient Greece, a civilization flourishing around the 8th century in the Year of the Lord. Here, virginity began to be closely associated with spiritual power and societal honor. The city of Athens, named after the goddess Athena, paid homage to the Eternal Virgin, exemplifying wisdom and warfare mastery, attributes typically associated with male gods. Athena's virginity wasn't just a personal trait, it symbolized her independence and self-sufficiency, ideals that shaped the Greek understanding of an empowered woman. Elsewhere in Greece, the city of Ephesus was the worship center for Artemis, another deity often associated with virginity. But unlike Athena, Artemis's virginity represented the freedom of the wilderness and the hunt, painting a different yet equally compelling portrait of feminine strength. Rome, which came to prominence around 753 in the Year of the Lord, had its own societal mechanisms that underscored the value of virginity. Vestal virgins, the priestesses of the Roman goddess Vesta, were responsible for maintaining the sacred fire in Vesta's temple, a duty only eligible to virgins. If they broke their vow of chastity, they faced the extreme punishment of being buried alive, a testament to how seriously the Romans took this commitment. Meanwhile, in ancient China, dating back to 2070 in the Year of the Lord, virginity held symbolic significance in marriage rituals. The three letters and six etiquettes, an elaborate courtship and marriage process from the Zhou dynasty, laid significant emphasis on the bride's virginity, manifesting in the color red, a symbol of joy and fertility, often featured in traditional wedding attire. Virginity wasn't merely a personal or family matter in these societies, it was a socio-political construct entangled in the fabric of their cultures, rituals and mythologies. Each civilization had its unique interpretation and practices surrounding virginity, yet they all shared a common thread, a reverence for purity and chastity, embodied in rituals, clothing, societal norms and divine figures. Veils of purity, probing ancient rituals of virginity. Let's begin our journey in Babylon, 
one of the world's oldest cities dating back to 1894 in the Year of the Lord. Here, the sacred marriage ceremony was an annual rite where the high priestess, representing the goddess Inanna, was united in symbolic courtship with the city's ruler, embodying the god Dumuzi. This ritual underscored the importance of the priestess's virginity, reinforcing societal norms and the divine sanctity of their union. Moving northeast, we arrive at medieval Europe in the Middle Ages, where virginity was deeply prized and extensively tested. A curious example is the cloth test, practiced in several European countries from the 5th to the 15th century. In this ritual, a newlywed couple was covered with a cloth during their first night of courtship. The morning after, the cloth, expected to be stained with blood, was publicly examined as proof of the bride's virginity. Meanwhile, in Japan, the Heian period, 794-1185, brought forth its unique rituals around virginity. The aristocratic women, before marriage, would blacken their teeth in a process called ohaguro. While primarily a beauty standard, this process symbolically represented the transition from maidenhood to womanhood. Traveling to the western shores of Africa in the Yoruba Kingdom, virginity testing rituals were steeped in symbolism. During the wedding ceremony, a white cloth was given to the bride, and the groom was asked to inspect it the morning after their first night together. If the cloth bore traces of blood, it signified the bride's purity and was often celebrated with public festivity. Across the globe, in ancient Mayan culture, a peculiar custom was followed, where the girl's mother would inspect her bedsheet following the first night of her union. The absence of bloodstains was seen as a bad omen, bringing disgrace to the family. Echoes of chastity, the biblical lens on virginity. The Bible, an influential tome dating back to around the 15th century, has woven stories of virginity into the hearts and minds of societies across centuries, shaping attitudes, beliefs, and practices. One of the most notable figures illuminating this biblical preoccupation with virginity is Mary, a humble maiden from the town of Nazareth. Referred to as the Virgin Mary, she is venerated in Christian faith as the mother of Jesus Christ. The angel, Gabriel, according to the Gospel of Luke, announced to her that she would conceive a child while maintaining her virginity, a divine conception that served to elevate the sanctity of virginity to celestial heights. This narrative, often recited during the Christmas season, resonates throughout Christian societies, reinforcing the paradigm of virginity as a symbol of purity and moral superiority. Similarly, in the Old Testament, virginity held paramount importance in matrimonial affairs. The book of Deuteronomy, for instance, established specific laws around a bride's purity. It states, If no proof of the girl's virginity can be found, she shall be brought to the door of her father's house, and there the men of her town shall stone her to death. This stark passage from Deuteronomy 22 underscores the severity of the consequences tied to virginity in biblical times, representing the societal norms and practices of that era. Biblical tales of other virgin figures also molded the perception of virginity in society. The parable of the ten virgins in the Gospel of Matthew describes ten maidens awaiting a bridegroom, symbolizing Christ's second coming. Five of them, termed wise, carried extra oil for their lamps, while the other five, termed foolish, did not. When the bridegroom arrived at midnight, only the prepared maidens could meet him. The rest were left in darkness. Here, virginity was more than physical chastity. It represented spiritual preparedness and wisdom. In the book of Judges, the story of Jephthah's daughter provides another perspective on the value of virginity. Jephthah, a warrior, makes a vow to sacrifice the first person he encounters after a successful battle. His daughter, a virgin, is the one who greets him, and he upholds his vow, letting her roam the mountains for two months to mourn her virginity. This episode reflects the tragedy associated with a life devoid of marital courtship and progeny, reinforcing the societal expectation of virgin maidens becoming wives and mothers. In ancient Corinth, a bustling city-state of Greece, the Apostle Paul's letters in the New Testament preached the virtue of virginity. He wrote, An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. 
Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. Corinthians 7. This biblical guidance further influenced the societal perception of virginity, marking it as a path towards spiritual dedication. Chessboards of chastity, virginity in the politics and power plays of the Middle Ages. As we step into the epoch of the Middle Ages, a period spanning from the 5th to the 15th century, the role of virginity shifts from the spiritual and religious spheres into the tangible world of politics and power. Here, the concept of virginity transforms into a prized asset, a token in the grand chessboard of societal alliances and power dynamics. The Middle Ages saw the rise of feudalism, a hierarchical system where power was concentrated among a select few nobles. In this intricate socio-political web, marriages were strategic moves designed for power consolidation, territorial acquisition, and lineage continuity. As such, a bride's virginity took center stage, signifying her honor and the prestige of her family, often tipping the scales in negotiating marital alliances. One such instance was the union of Eleanor of Aquitaine and Louis VII of France in 1137. Eleanor, one of the wealthiest and most powerful women in Western Europe, brought with her the promise of the vast Aquitaine to the French crown. Her virginity, a prized attribute, was used as leverage in securing this advantageous match, thus changing the geopolitical landscape of Europe. The cult of virgin saints also thrived in the Middle Ages, with figures like Saint Cecilia, the patroness of music, and Saint Agnes, symbolizing chastity, becoming popular. These virgin saints were revered, and their stories, often recited in homilies, added another layer to the perception of virginity, emphasizing its association with spiritual virtue, divine favor, and martyrdom. In the realm of literature, too, virginity was idealized. The concept of courtly love, prevalent in medieval literature, often depicted knights undertaking perilous quests to win the favor of a noble and unattainable virgin lady. This genre of literature, including notable works like Sir Thomas Mallory's Le Mort d'Arthur and Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, reinforced the reverence for virginity, shaping societal attitudes towards courtship and romance. Veiled Illusions, the unseen craft of feigning purity through ages. In the grand tapestry of human history, the perception of virginity has been woven with numerous threads of societal norms and expectations. Unraveling these intricate patterns reveals the often veiled aspect of this discourse, the art of feigning virginity. An ancient example of such practice can be traced back to Rome around 27 BC 476 AD. Roman women were expected to enter their marriages as virgins, a custom strictly observed in society. Aulus Gellius, a Roman author and philosopher, documented a curious account in his work Attic Nights about how a woman named Marcia might have used an aloe vera extract to contract her female reproductive system, giving the illusion of virginity. As we sail across the timeline, we reach the shores of the Middle Ages in Europe, around 500, 1500 AD. During this period, a concoction known as St. Hildegard's Dew was a popular choice among ladies of the night wishing to simulate purity. Named after the famed Abbess Hildegard of Bingen, this potion was a blend of fennel, garden rocket and penny royal, known for its potential to constrict the female reproductive system. Another historical strategy employed to create the illusion of virginity was the use of blood. In 18th century France, a quote famously attributed to Madame de Sévigné, a French author, mentions women using chicken blood for this purpose. However, it's essential to understand that this practice wasn't merely limited to the West. Even in cultures across Asia, from China to India, variations of this method have been historically reported. Clandestine artifacts also played their part in this delicate dance of deception. The concept of artificial hymens has been reported in various cultures, with instances recorded in regions from the Middle East to Asia. These usually involved the use of delicate membranes that, when ruptured, mimicked the bleeding often mistakenly associated with a woman's first experience of courtship. In more recent times, with the advent of modern medicine, these practices have evolved into medical procedures, such as hymenoplasty, offering a more reliable means to simulate virginity. 
This surgical procedure, which involves the reconstruction of the hymen, began gaining popularity in the late 20th century. However, it's important to note that such procedures have their share of ethical and medical controversies. The widespread practice of simulating virginity, while fascinating, serves as a poignant reflection of the immense pressure and scrutiny women have faced concerning their purity. From ancient Rome to the present day, the ability to feign virginity has been weaponized by women as a means to navigate societies that placed a disproportionate emphasis on their purity. Joan of Arc, the unblemished lily amidst the flames. Born in 1412 in the small village of Domremy in northeastern France, Joan of Arc, fondly known as La Pucelle or the Maid, is an emblem of courage, conviction and celestial guidance. Her tale is an extraordinary one, a narrative where the significance of her virginity becomes a symbol of divine endorsement and moral superiority, making her stand out in the annals of history. At the tender age of 13, amidst the turmoil of the Hundred Years' War, Joan began to experience visions of Saints Michael, Catherine and Margaret, who, she believed, entrusted her with the divine mission to support Charles VII and recover France from English domination. Her conviction was so robust that it moved mountains, culminating in her gaining an audience with Charles VII, the disinherited French Dauphin, at his court in Chinon in 1429. Charles, intrigued by Joan's steadfast conviction and celestial claims, had her examined by a group of theologians and doctors. They confirmed her mental and physical wellness, and more notably, her intact virginity, reinforcing the authenticity of her divine mission. La Puchelle's virgin status became a crucial part of her persona, a divine seal of approval, if you will. It accorded her a certain sanctity and moral authority that was instrumental in rallying troops and acquiring allies. It was believed that only a person of such purity could have been chosen for such a divine mission. This perception helped her lead the French army to a momentous victory at Orléans in May 1429, turning the tides of the war in favor of the French. Joan's reputation, however, also made her a target. Captured in 1430 by the Burgundians, she was handed over to the English. Here, her virginity took center stage again during her trial, led by Pierre Cochon, a bishop who was sympathetic to the English cause. Despite intense interrogation and inhumane conditions, Joan stood resolute, her faith unwavering. Intriguingly, even at this juncture, Joan's sartorial choices were guided by the need to preserve her chastity. Opting to wear male attire, a decision which later became one of the charges against her, was a pragmatic move to deter assault while in captivity. Better a soldier's trousers than a woman's assault, she was known to assert, underlining her determination to maintain her purity, a symbolic embodiment of her moral integrity and divine connection. Tragically, despite her courage and charisma, Joan was declared a heretic and burnt at the stake in ruin in 1431 at just 19 years old. A mere 25 years later, the verdict was posthumously overturned and Joan was declared a martyr. It wasn't until 1920 that Joan was canonized, her virginity, a significant facet of her sainthood, reinforcing her status as an icon of moral virtue and divine favor. Elizabeth I, the unwed sovereign of power and purity. In the year 1533, a royal proclamation heralded the birth of a princess in Greenwich, London, Elizabeth, the daughter of King Henry VIII VIII and his second wife, Anne Boleyn. Little did the world know then that this infant would grow to become one of the most influential monarchs in history, the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth I. As a young princess, Elizabeth received an education befitting a prince, which was unusual for women of that time. Scholars tutored her in languages, mathematics and the classics, instilling in her a strong foundation in politics and statecraft that would later guide her during her reign. Her formative years, though marred by scandal and sorrow with her mother's execution and the disregard of her father, nonetheless prepared her for the path she was destined to tread. In 1558, at the age of 25, Elizabeth ascended to the throne after the death of her half-sister, Queen Mary I. The kingdom she inherited was fraught with political, religious and economic unrest. 
However, Elizabeth, through a combination of strength, intellect, and the strategic use of her virgin status, managed to bring about an era of stability and prosperity, known as the Elizabethan era. Elizabeth never married, a decision that was both personal and political. In an era when women were expected to marry and bear children, she cleverly used her unwed status to her advantage. She was acutely aware that marriage, especially to a foreign prince, could result in the loss of England's autonomy and her authority as a monarch. And so, she chose to remain the Virgin Queen, tying her kingdom's welfare to her unwed status. She famously declared, I will have but one mistress here and no master, an assertion of her independence and authority. Her decision led to numerous courtships from noble suitors, each hoping to become her consort and gain control over England. Elizabeth adeptly navigated these propositions, keeping her suitors at bay while avoiding diplomatic incidents. She would often engage in long courtship rituals without ever agreeing to a marriage proposal. These courtships served a dual purpose. They allowed Elizabeth to maintain alliances while reinforcing her image as a chaste and devoted monarch, loyal only to her kingdom. Over her 44-year reign, the symbolism of Elizabeth's virginity evolved. It became a strategic tool in her diplomatic arsenal and a representation of England's independence and strength. A cult-like devotion sprung up around her, with poets and artists comparing her to Astria, the virgin goddess of innocence and purity, and Cynthia, the moon goddess, symbols that underscored her purity and divine right to rule. One of the most famous depictions is the Siege of Mons portrait, where Elizabeth is painted with an ermine at her feet, a symbol of purity and virginity. The Latin inscription, Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, the undefiled lily among thorns, underlines the image of her as a paragon of virtue, her unwed status serving as a powerful emblem of her reign. The lock and key of purity, chastity belts and illusions of virginity in Renaissance Europe. Stepping back into the epoch of the Renaissance, a period hailed for its cultural, artistic and intellectual awakening, we come face to face with a lesser known facet of the era, the mystifying world of chastity belts and the theatrical performance of purity. Contrary to popular belief, chastity belts, depicted as iron girdles locked around the waist, were not an omnipresent fixture in daily life during the Renaissance. These devices, made infamous by folklore, were more likely to be found in the vivid imaginations of poets and playwrights than in the wardrobes of Renaissance ladies. Chastity belts were more symbol than substance, often serving as comedic devices in plays or as metaphors in moralizing tales. While it's not impossible that such devices existed, the uncomfortable, not to mention unsanitary nature of these contraptions, made their actual use highly impractical. In fact, many of the authentic chastity belts displayed in museums today have been proven to be Victorian forgeries, created to titillate the audience with the perceived prudishness and eccentricities of the past. However, while the existence of chastity belts may be largely a myth, the period did witness attempts to falsify virginity, largely due to the high societal and economic value placed on a woman's purity. In the Renaissance, a woman's purity was her dowry, her virtue and her social standing. Hence, some resorted to dubious methods to prove their virginity. One such method involved the use of a capon's blood, a type of rooster. A bride-to-be would hide the blood in her nuptial bed, making it appear the next morning as though the hymen had been broken. A macabre practice indeed, yet it speaks volumes about the pressure placed on women of the time to maintain an image of purity. There were also apothecaries, the pharmacists of the day, who offered concoctions to tighten the female reproductive system, giving the illusion of virginity. These concoctions were often a mix of herbs, vinegar and other ingredients. Some even recommended alum, a type of salt known for its astringent properties, though this was not without potential harm. However, these practices, more than anything else, underscore the skewed power dynamics of the time. Women were subjected to societal expectations and standards that often left them in vulnerable positions, leading to these desperate measures to maintain their perceived purity. In the swirl of Renaissance intrigue, a quote from the famous Italian writer Niccolo Machiavelli rings true. In The Mandrake, he wrote, Marriage is like a besieged castle. 
Those who are on the outside wish to get in, and those who are on the inside wish to get out. These words seem fitting as they capture the paradoxical situation of women who found themselves caught between societal expectations of purity and their own desires and aspirations. Imposing Purity, the Colonial Shadow on Virginity When the first light of dawn bathed the newly discovered lands, the colonial era was ushered in, an era marked not only by exploration and trade, but also by the imposition of new cultural norms. Virginity, in particular, became a potent symbol, a tool of control wielded by the colonizers over the colonized. An exploration into the historical events reveals the far-reaching impact of colonialism on perceptions of virginity. Let us embark on a journey, beginning in the 15th century with Christopher Columbus's arrival in the Americas. The Spanish conquistadors brought with them their deeply ingrained societal values, where a woman's purity was akin to her worth, this perspective contrasted starkly with many indigenous cultures that had differing views on virginity and courtship. In certain tribal societies like the Arawak, from whom the Caribs descended, early encounters were marked by an open acceptance of courtship. Such practices were deemed uncivilized by the European colonizers who sought to impose their own moral code, one where virginity held paramount significance. In Africa, too, the advent of European colonial powers in the 19th century disrupted local norms. Prior to colonization, various African societies celebrated womanhood and courtship through unique rituals and practices. However, under colonial rule, these practices were dismissed as barbaric, supplanted by the European ideals of purity and virginity. One of the most illustrative examples can be seen in India under British rule. Victorian-era morality seeped into the Indian societal fabric, with the colonizers upholding virginity as a marker of a woman's honor. This imposition often disregarded existing social customs, such as the tantric traditions where physical intimacy was considered a spiritual journey. It's noteworthy to mention the poignant tale of Rukhmabai, an Indian woman forced into marriage at a young age. She made headlines in both India and England in the late 19th century when she refused to live with her husband. Despite the societal norms of the time, she took a stand against marital coercion, her story stirring debates on women's rights and chastity. The colonial narrative around virginity was often intertwined with the notion of civilizing the savage, a paternalistic ideology used to justify colonial rule. In his book, Discourse on Colonialism, Aimé Césaire a renowned francophone writer from Martinique noted, They talk to me about progress, about achievements, diseases cured, but they never showed me what they had broken. Indeed, the concept of virginity, once fluid and diverse, was constricted and redefined under colonial rule, its legacy lingering in societal norms and attitudes long after the colonizers had retreated. The colonial construct of purity became a yoke around the neck of many cultures, their practices deemed illicit and in need of correction. The Gilded Cage, Victorian ideals and the valorization of virginity. As the sands of time trickled into the 19th century, a veil of prudishness descended upon Britain. The Victorian era, named after Queen Victoria, who reigned from 1837 to 1901, was marked by a society swathed in a strict moral code, elevating the virtue of purity and virginity to unprecedented heights. A woman's purity was the touchstone of her reputation, and losing one's virginity outside of the holy bonds of matrimony was tantamount to societal ruin. It was an era of courtship and chaperones, where the most intimate of human relationships were carefully chaperoned. Frowned upon was any breach of decorum, from passionate letters to unseemly conduct, everything was under scrutiny. There are instances aplenty to illustrate this societal obsession with virginity. The Agnus Dei, or Lamb of God, was a symbolic device employed by many Victorian novelists, including Charles Dickens and Thomas Hardy. It served as a metaphorical representation of innocence and purity, often depicting female characters who epitomized the ideal of virginity. Take, for instance, Hardy's Tess of the D'Urbervilles. In this poignant tale, the protagonist Tess is portrayed as a pure woman, her innocence tragically manipulated 
by the villainous Alec d'Urberville. The societal consequences Tess faces after her loss of virginity vividly depict the Victorian era's unforgiving views on this subject. Not only literature, but Victorian societal norms also seeped into the realm of science, giving birth to dubious theories. The infamous Two Spheres ideology, posited by Victorian medical practitioners like Dr. William Acton, suggested that women were inherently passive and devoid of any physical desires. Any deviation from this norm was pathologized, often leading to harsh treatments with medicines or other drastic measures. In this landscape of repression, there was, however, a spark of dissent. The social purity movement, spearheaded by women like Josephine Butler, sought to challenge societal norms. Butler famously campaigned against the Contagious Diseases Act, laws that unfairly targeted ladies of the night in a bid to protect them from exploitation. Another iconic figure from this era, Florence Nightingale, a pioneer in modern nursing, rejected the conventional path of marriage to devote herself to health care. In a letter to her sister, she famously wrote, I have an intellectual nature which requires satisfaction, and that would find it in him. Here, him referred to her profession. By the end of the 19th century, voices like Butler and Nightingale began to challenge the Victorian obsession with virginity and purity, laying the foundation for future reform. However, it would be a long road to change, with the shadows of the era's moral codes lingering well into the 20th century. Unraveling the tangle, the scientific realities and enduring myths of virginity. Unfolding within the labyrinth of science and societal norms is the complex narrative of virginity. This narrative, especially in relation to the female anatomy, has been warped by the woven threads of misconception, giving birth to misleading theories, such as the hymen myth. This belief erroneously asserts that the intactness of a woman's hymen is an unfailing indicator of her virginity. First identified by the ancient Greeks, the hymen, a small membrane partially covering the entrance to the female reproductive system, became the focal point of virginity verification in numerous cultures. But the essence of this myth, that the hymen tears and bleeds during the first instance of courtship, is scientifically unfounded. Scientific studies, such as the one conducted by Dr. Sarah Patterson Brown in 1998, have underscored the wide range of hymen shapes and sizes, proving its appearance and physical state cannot be deemed a reliable measure of virginity. Some women are even born without one. This myth, however, had an insidious grip on societal beliefs. The infamous virginity tests, which flourished as a perverse cultural practice in various parts of the world, had roots in this ill-founded hypothesis. In 1552, renowned French surgeon Ambroise Paire wrote in his works about performing a virginity test on a woman at the request of her husband, a horrifying indication of the depths to which the hymen myth had penetrated societal fabric. This myth not only straddled cultures, but spanned eras, finding prominence in the 19th century medical community. A prominent figure perpetuating it was Dr. William Acton, a Victorian era physician who in his work, The Functions and Disorders of the Reproductive Organs, propagated the notion of the hymen as a seal of virginity. Despite these long-standing misconceptions, the 20th century brought the winds of change. Visionaries like Dr. Mary Calderon, a public health advocate, worked tirelessly to debunk the hymen myth. Calderon's groundbreaking paper in 1968, Changes in the Female Reproductive System and Continuity from the Standpoint of the Hymen, challenged the archaic notions, helping to steer the medical community towards a more accurate understanding of virginity. Unfortunately, even in the face of scientific clarity, the myth continued to hold sway. In 2019, the World Health Organization issued guidelines categorically opposing virginity testing, reflecting the enduring societal fixation on the hymen myth. The fact that such a directive was necessary in the 21st century demonstrates the dangerous resilience of these misconceptions. In the trenches of dichotomy, the Virgin and the Lady of the Night in times of conflict. As the spectre of war descended on the world in the early 20th century, it drastically transformed societal constructs and perceptions of femininity, 
particularly around concepts of virginity and morality. During this tumultuous period, an unsettling dichotomy emerged in which women were characterized either as paragons of purity, the virgins, or their stark opposites, the so-called ladies of the night. The world wars, and particularly World War II, exacerbated this polarization. The idealized image of women was that of wholesome, patriotic figures who maintained the home front, taking on roles traditionally held by men while preserving their purity. Propaganda posters from this era often featured virtuous, virginal women epitomizing innocence, strength and patriotism. One notable example is the iconic We Can Do It poster featuring Rosie the Riveter, a symbol of women's empowerment and moral uprightness. Contrasting this virtuous image was the portrayal of ladies of the night, often seen as the unfortunate casualties of the harsh realities of war. Their stories, though, were often steeped in complex narratives of survival, resilience and sacrifice. An unsettling yet significant part of this narrative is the tragic saga of the comfort women, a euphemistic term for young women, primarily from Korea and China, coerced into providing comfort to Japanese soldiers during World War II. The story of these women who were forced into such roles under the guise of mandatory work orders or promises of factory jobs is heart-wrenching. The existence of the comfort women system was initially revealed to the wider world in 1991 by a brave Korean woman named Kim Hak-soon, who shared her harrowing experiences and subsequently sparked global attention to these war atrocities. Around the same time, the French had their term, horizontal collaborators, referring to women who were seen to have courted German soldiers during the German occupation of France. These women were later publicly humiliated in post-liberation France, further emphasizing the dichotomy prevalent during war. The treatment of these women after the war further magnified the dichotomy. Many comfort women returned home, bearing the burden of shame and silence, while the horizontal collaborators were subjected to public scorn and ostracization. These societal reactions starkly contrasted the celebratory welcome reserved for their virginal counterparts, who, having adhered to traditional norms, were lauded as patriotic heroes. This dichotomy is poignantly captured in Simone de Beauvoir's book, where she states, humanity is male, and man defines woman not in herself, but in relation to himself. This perspective highlights the war era's reinforcement of male-centric societal norms, with women being valued or devalued based on their perceived conformity to the standards of purity. As we draw the curtains on this evocative journey through the labyrinth of history, we find ourselves standing at the intersection of societal expectations and personal identities. Through Roman extracts of aloe vera to St. Hildegard's mysterious dew, from the cunning play of chicken blood to the advent of modern medical procedures, the chronicles of feigning purity reflect the ever-pervasive discourse of virginity. Yet, beyond these fascinating narratives and figures, what persists is the echo of a profound societal pressure that continues to reverberate through centuries. The mechanisms to simulate virginity, while evolving in technique, have their roots entwined in a systemic culture that has often valued women for their perceived purity, rather than their individual worth. It's time for us to part ways, but let's bid farewell with the thought-provoking words of Gloria Steinem, a beacon of the feminist movement. A liberated woman is one who has relations before marriage and a job after. This powerful sentiment encapsulates a message of freedom and individuality, reminding us that virginity and worth are not intertwined. In this endeavor, may the history we have explored today serve not just as a curiosity, but as a beacon illuminating the path towards a future of respect, understanding, and equality.